It's sad to be out of Ephesians for a couple weeks, but I'm certainly looking forward to our time together looking at the seven different statements that Jesus made while He hung on the cross, which the four Gospel writers have recorded for us. For the believer, the, the cross is filled with different emotions. Really a paradox of emotions. A, a sermon I heard several years ago talked about one of these. So to begin to understand the pain and agony that our beloved Savior went through should, should move us to pity. It should move us to compassion. We should be sickened in our flesh by the gruesome and cruel death that He suffered. But on the other hand, another emotion that rises up within us should be one of joy that He did. We want to go back to that dreadful day and, and try to dissuade the crowds from crying out, we want Barabbas or, or crucify Jesus. We want to go back and, 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 and keep Him from hanging on the cross. And in any way we can, we want to try to dissuade Him from, from doing this. The truth is and the reality is that we needed Him to do this. We needed Him to die on that cross. We needed Him to fulfill the Father's will in all of this so that we would never have to. There is a sorrowful gratefulness for the believer. We are sad that our sin nailed Him to the cross. But we are so grateful that He was nailed to the cross. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at some of the events on the cross through the lens of these seven sayings that Jesus spoke while hanging there. These seven statements, as we'll see, were reveal a lot about the heart of Jesus and certainly reveal the purpose of why the cross was necessary. Some of the influence of these sermons come from a man named A.W. Pink. He wrote a book, The Seven Sayings of the Savior on the Cross. And Pink does an excellent job of, of mining the depths of these statements. And certainly one week is hardly enough to do justice, so on, on just one of these scenes. And so we're only going to really be able to scratch the surface of all seven of these as we cover them in, in two weeks. But the words of Jesus, not just what He said on the cross, were all very calculated and intentional. Each word was meant to point us to something. Each word that Jesus spoke was meant to point us to the Father or, or point us to His work. Point us to some truth that has eternal value. And these words of Jesus that the authors of these four Gospels have written down for us are certainly no different. There, there is great meaning in each statement, and each statement points us to Himself. It points us to the Father, or points us to the purpose of the cross, and to show us at certain points the fulfillment of the Word of God, the fulfillment of prophecy. So my prayer is that this will be a rich study for you as it has been for me. Briefly, these seven statements made on the cross by Jesus will help us fully understand the person and work of the Son of God. In Luke 23, 34, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Shortly after, Luke tells us in chapter 23, verse 43, Jesus say, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. In John 19, verses 26 and 27, Jesus says, Woman, behold your son. And just shortly after, he says, Behold your mother. Then in Mark 15, 34, in agony, Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in John 19, verse 28, Jesus says, I thirst. John 19.30, he declares it is finished. And finally, Luke wraps up with the last saying in chapter 23.46, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The order in which we're going to work through these seems to be consistent with the time frame in which Jesus said them while on the cross for those six or so brutal hours. So turn with me to Luke chapter 23, verse 34. As we look at this first saying, 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here we see Jesus' compassionate heart towards sinners. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What a statement. Many believe this to be spoken as the nails are being driven through His hands and feet. Or just shortly after, just having been raised up into the air, suspending Himself on the, on the cross and having all His body weight resting on the nails that were sticking in, and the nails sticking through His hands and feet. These words would have been prayed in the midst of great physical pain. These words are a fulfillment, we know, of prophecy, uh, prophecy that we have from Isaiah in chapter 3, 53 in Isaiah. In writing about the coming Messiah and the atonement that this Savior would make, Isaiah says this in verse 12 of chapter 3. He says, Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So although Jesus at the Father's right hand today is making intercession for his people, we know that the context of Isaiah 53 is not speaking about his office of high priest that he's currently fulfilling. There is something else going on here in Isaiah 53. Isaiah is talking about the crucifixion. And so Luke records these words for us, at least in part, to help us understand how the Old Testament continuously pointed to Christ and that Christ came in part to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. This is further proof to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah that was spoken of and promised by the law of prophets. But more than that, it certainly does prove who Jesus was and is. But it also reveals to us his heart and his character. Again, Jesus prays to the Father that the Father might forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we need to make sure that we understand that ignorance does not clear one of guilt. In fact, J.C. Ryle says that one's ignorance is part of the sinner's guilt, it is part of man's sin. So when Jesus prays this, he is not uh, stating that this ignorance is an excuse. Ignorance will not stand up in the court of a holy judge. It too deserves eternal punishment just as any sin does. But in saying this phrase, Jesus is simply describing for us their state. They are in a state of ignorance, which I believe, and along with many other theologians, that this state of ignorance is not as grave as someone who knows who Jesus is, who has been taught the gospel, who has been shown the truth of who they are and what they need, and yet they still flat out reject it. The author of Hebrews alludes to this in chapter 6, 4 through 6 of his epistle. He says, For it is impossible for the case of those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the Holy Gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. The author of Hebrews is speaking about one who is not ignorant. Paul says of these ignorant people in 1 Corinthians 2.8, None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So there seems to be hanging on the cross at this moment a certain amount of compassion that our Lord has and wants for those who are ignorant. They still need the gospel. They still need forgiveness. They still need a Savior. But He is tenderhearted towards them. He is compassionate. He pities them. And He prays for them to be forgiven. believe that this group of people that Jesus is praying for just might include the Roman soldiers who are responsible for the nails being driven in his hands and feet. If you look down into to verse 47, 
I believe the Father forgave the centurion who oversaw his crucifixion. I believe he prayed for the many Jews who cried out, crucify him on that day. Many of those who watched him carry his cross from Jerusalem to Calgotha, who observed him hanging on the cross in agony. Again, look at verse 48 of this chapter. tells us. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And if you turn to Acts 3, and you look at verse 17, Peter has just healed a man who had not been able to walk for his whole life. And as a large crowd began to gather around to witness what had just happened, Peter began to preach. He says, don't be amazed at this miracle. But be amazed because the man who you all murdered and denied has been raised from the dead. And in verse 17 of this chapter in Acts, he says, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your fathers, or as, your, as did your rulers. And then he continued to call them to repentance. And when you read on, Luke tells us that many of them did repent. Many of them did uh, place their faith in Jesus because thousands of them were saved, we're told. See, these ignorant men and women did not understand the gravity of who they were crucifying. They did not know Jesus was the Messiah. They did not know He was King of Kings. They did not know that He was the Son of God. This did not make them right with God, but it did cause their Savior and Messiah to have pity and compassion on them. And so we prayed for them to be forgiven. This is what Jesus is pointing us to when He says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you in Matthew 5.44. And Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 2, 21-23, He says, For this... You have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. See, Jesus is beginning to feel the full brunt of the Father's wrath. He's about to go through hell, and his mind and thought at that moment was not himself, but these people who would experience his very wrath unless he goes through it for them. And so he prays. He prays that the Father will pour the wrath that they deserve on him. What compassion. What a heart that is tender towards those who do not know him. What forgiveness he offers to those who need it. Brothers and sisters, this is what he did for you and me. His compassionate heart caused him to absorb the wrath that you and I deserved the very first time he sinned. And when he did, our forgiveness was guaranteed. In this statement, we come to know that Jesus truly came to save sinners. second statement that Jesus makes that we're going to look at is just a few verses later on in Luke 23 verse 43. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now this statement is made as many of you know in the context of this interaction between Jesus and the, uh, the two other men who were crucified right beside him. Luke tells us, beginning in verse 39, that one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. 
And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. One thing you will notice as we continue to work through these spoken words of our Lord's is that each statement is full of theology. It's full of doctrine. And we really could have taken one statement per week. And that certainly holds true of this statement. In this statement, we could discuss the whole issue of what happens to a soul when it is dead, when it dies. This statement alone debunks the whole Roman Catholic teaching of the need for purgatory. And then there's even a popular teaching within some evangelical circles what's referred to as soul sleep. Soul sleep is this erroneous teaching that when a believer dies, his or her soul, his or her soul in a sense, goes to sleep. It remains in a state of dormancy. And only at the resurrection does it wake up and be welcomed into the presence of the Lord. The soul, like the body that is asleep, doesn't realize the time that has elapsed between physical death and this waking up. So it seems as if it happens instantaneous, but in reality it could be hundreds or thousands of years. Well, again, this statement refutes that belief. We also could spend time discussing what and where paradise is. J.C. Ryle simply says it's the state of faithful souls between death and the resurrection. The soul is conscious of the presence of Jesus and no more need of faith because their sight in Him has been granted. Beyond this statement, but connected to it, we, we also see God's sovereign election being worked out. Two thieves hanging on either side of Him, equally depraved, equally being punished for their crimes, hearing and seeing the very same things. They're hearing and seeing the mocking and the jeering and the wicked abuse of power and unjust condemnation of an innocent man. Yet one of them is saved, and the other one dies in his sin. In the very few minutes that this man had with Jesus, he was given great understanding of who Jesus is. He was giving great understanding of who he was, what he deserved, and what Jesus came to do. Again, we could spend a lot of time looking at what simple faith is, an acknowledgement of one's sin and Christ's sinlessness and a plea for Christ to save. Again, there's no attempt to explain to Jesus why he's on the cross. There's no justification for this man's actions he deserves what is happening, and Jesus does not. And there's certainly not a full understanding of who Jesus is, but the thief does know that he is the rightful king to the throne of David, and he has a kingdom of his own. This morning I want to just focus on what this statement even tells us about Jesus. That he is gracious to all those who have a soft, penitent heart towards him. Turn with me to Matthew. Matthew chapter 20. Here we find an example, I believe, of what is going on. Matthew 20, look at verses 14 to 16. Just briefly, in this parable of the Lord, one of the truths he is communicating is his graciousness. I don't want to read this whole parable, but many of you are familiar with it. The master hires workers to work in his vineyard. He hires them early in the morning. He negotiates a fair wage so that both parties are satisfied with the common wage for a laborer, a denarius. A bit later, this master, he hires some more workers and sends them out. And a bit later, same thing, again and again. Until the end of the day comes, when the workers come out of the, of the vineyard, the master settles up with them. He pays them their wage. And he paid them all equally. He paid them all a denarius. But as we see, the men who were hired in the morning, the first ones hired, did not like this. And so they complained. They expected to be paid more when they saw that the workers who were hired late in the day were paid a denarius. 
they automatically assume that they would be paid more. And the Master says this in chapter 20, verse 14. Just take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. I think in Matthew 20, Jesus wants to address the complaining heart of the workers. But more than that, he wants to address what they're complaining against. They were complaining against the master's generosity, the master's graciousness. He wasn't being fair to the early workers they believed. But he wasn't being fair, unfair to them. They had agreed on the wages. He was simply being generous and gracious to the ones he hired late in the day. And Jesus, the master, has every right to save. He has every right to save some early in life. He has every right to save some in the middle of the life. And he has every right to save some on their deathbed. It's the simple fact that he saves any at all is a clear testament to his grace. But no matter when one is saved, all will receive heaven and eternity in His presence all the same. This is just one example of the promise of Isaiah 53.11 being fulfilled. It says, Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Brothers and sisters, this promise holds just as true for this man than it does for a godly man who had been saved and walking with the Lord for 70 years. This man's sins were bore on that cross and he was accounted righteous. And brothers and sisters, this is true of all of us here this morning who by faith have grabbed a hold of the truth of who Jesus is and what He's done. Your baptism, your church attendance, your service, your prayers and Bible reading, your family heritage, your doctrinal positions have no influence on Jesus' graciousness in your salvation. Again, J.C. Ryle helps us understand this. He says, do we want proof that salvation is of grace and not by works? We have it in the case before us. The dying thief was nailed hand and foot to the cross he could do literally nothing of his own soul, yet even he, through Christ's infinite grace, was saved. Royal continues. He says, The dying thief was never baptized, never belonged to a visible church. He would never receive the Lord's Supper, but he repent, repented and believed, and therefore he was saved. This is the great mercy and grace of our Lord. That there are no works, brothers and sisters, that are required for salvation other than His. There's no allotted time necessary for one to enter into heaven. There's nothing that needs to happen in one's life to prove that, excuse me, that salvation has happened. When Jesus saves someone, they are instantly and completely saved. There's no waiting period to see if it's stuck. The grace of Jesus is powerful enough to finish what he began. And he will see that nothing will separate his elect from his love. And so we believe that the thief, the instant he died, because of the grace of Jesus, entered instantaneously into paradise. And brothers and sisters, because of the grace of Jesus, we may have to wait a little bit longer than this man did in order to die. But we too can be just as assured that we will be with him in paradise the instant we do. Not because of any requirements we have met, but because of all the requirements he met on our behalf. Thirdly, this morning, I ask you to turn to John 19. John 19, verses 26 and 27, as we look at the third statement that Jesus made on the cross. 
two different verses. Jesus says, Woman, behold your son, and behold your mother. We understand again this context, this statement is addressed as we see from the previous verses. He is addressing this, first of all, to Mary, his mother, and the second to John, the disciple whom he loved. For just a moment, just imagine. Imagine Mary standing there. Imagine the emotion, the sorrow, the agony that, that the mother of Jesus would have been going through at this time, watching her son suffer this pain. To watch a child die would be hard enough. But to watch the way in which her son died would have been excruciating. Simeon, in his prophetic declaration, while holding the son of Mary in his arms shortly after his birth, he says it like this in Luke 2, verse 34 and 35. We're told, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And the sword will pierce through your own soul also, he tells Mary. Watching this happen to Jesus would have been like a sword piercing through the very soul of her. And so it is with this in mind that we see the affection that Jesus has towards His own. And I really think that there are two parallel truths that come out of these statements. And I think the first is obvious to us. Jesus is making sure that His earthly biological mother is going to be taken care of. Again, most probable at this time, Joseph, her husband, has died. And so she would have had a hard time providing for her material needs. And as far as we can tell, Jesus' siblings at this time had not yet believed in her. And so Jesus, as he hangs there on the cross, having to lift himself up by his hands and feet that had these spikes driven through them so that he might be able to get air in his lungs, he looks down. In a sense, he tells her to go live with John and tells John to take care of her. Jesus knows the sorrow and the fear that Mary's going through and will continue to experience after he's dead. And so his affection for her comes out in the fact that he, even in the midst of some of the most unimaginable physical pain, makes sure his mother is going to be taken care of. But I think more than that is the second truth is not just the physical reality of this affection, but I believe that Jesus is also showing us a picture of a spiritual reality as well. Each one of these statements made by Jesus on the cross contains a spiritual truth that is communicated in the physical context that is around what is being said. Each statement points us to His divine mission. They help us understand what He came to do and what, was act, what He was actually accomplishing on the cross. And I believe that holds true for this one as well. There's more going on here than just Jesus making sure His mother is taken care of. Something more to help us understand what Jesus is dying for. The word that Jesus uses in both of these statements that we translate behold is helpful in understanding this. One commentator makes this observation. He says, John uses this word where there is a challenge to perceive with the mind a truth not outwardly evident to human eyes. So Jesus says, behold, he's telling us that there's more going on here than what you can just see. And it's this. Jesus is not just telling Mary that she is to treat John as her son and that John is to treat Mary as his mother. Jesus is now reaffirming a different kind of sonship, a different kind of family that is going to exist between his followers. Jesus, Mark tells us in his gospel account, says this in Mark 3, 33 and 35. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around those that sat around him, he said, here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So notice, too, that, that Jesus calls Mary woman and not mother. 
He does this one other time in John 2, verse 4, when he tells him that the wine, or when she tells him that the wine had run out at the wedding in Cana. And this event happens at the very beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. In fact, it's, it's the first miracle that he, that, that he performs or that is recorded for us. And it is here that Jesus says, Woman, what does this have to do with me? And we certainly know and we understand that this in no way is meant to communicate any disrespect for his mother. Right, kids? Because that's a sin. But Jesus addresses his mother in both of these instances as woman to distance himself from their physical, earthly relationship. It's used to communicate to Mary and all those presents in, in these two contexts that Jesus is the Son of God. The Son of the Father, and that His relationship with her goes beyond this blood relationship. And so yes, Jesus is certainly taking care of His earthly physical mother, but not through a change in a physical, earthly, cultural way. She still had family alive. Jesus is communicating a new spiritual reality, the family of God. That because of his sacrifice, his followers enter into a familial relationship with each other. Jesus says, John, Mary, listen. Because of what I am doing at this very moment, because I am bearing the wrath of the Father and ransoming, ransom, giving my life for your redemption, because of all this, I bring reconciliation to you and all those that I am dying for. Between you all and the Father, I am establishing this new relationship. One full of adopted children who are now under one Father. John, I'm not giving her to you because she's my mother, but because I am dying for you both. And in me, you are brought into this family relationship with each other. I believe John or Mark communicates this in Mark 10, verses 23 to 31. You can turn there with me as well. Mark 10. Again, I, I don't want to take time to read this whole this whole passage. But the context of Jesus is is talking in is the rich young ruler. And Jesus is helping his followers understand the gospel. In Mark 10, verse 28, Peter reminds Jesus, as if Jesus needed a reminder, that they had left everything to follow him. And here's where I want to begin with you in, in this passage this morning, is in verse 29. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time? Houses, and brothers, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands of persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But again, many who are first will be last, and the last first. Jesus says that those who follow him will receive a hundredfold in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands in this time. Not in the future or in heaven, but in this time. Now certainly, we reject the prosperity gospel. So how do we understand what Jesus is promising here? I believe it's connected to what Jesus has said to Mary and John on the cross. That we receive these things in the community, in the body, in this new family that Jesus' work of atonement brings us into. All that we give up, all that we sacrifice, all that we might lose by following Christ will be resupplied by our new family. We might lose and be rejected by our earthly family, but we have a new one. We might lose a job opportunity because of our faith, but our new family who, go back to Ephesians, right? Who works hard and, general, and generously will help out in times of need. We might lose everything, but we gain so much more through the body of Christ, through the new relationships we have in Him. 
And I believe that this is what Jesus is communicating. He says, that by my death, as I absorb the wrath of the Father on your behalf, I am reconciling you to the Father and bringing you into a new family, a spiritual family. What a comforting truth. That Jesus' death on the cross brings us into this new relationship with each other. Paul calls it a body. Jesus calls it a family. And this is why we cannot just call each other brothers and sisters, but we must treat each other that way as well. All brought about by what Jesus was doing at the very moment that he spoke these words. Finally this morning, turn back or turn to Mark chapter 15. In verse 34, as we see the fourth statement of Jesus on the cross. I can't even hardly speak English, so I'm not even going to try these words. I will read the translation of them. When Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And here we see Christ's sacrificial love towards his own. And by the time we get to this statement, Jesus has been on the cross for several hours. Mark in chapter 15, verse 25, indicates that all this began around 9 a.m., the third hour. And now in verse 34, he tells us that it's the ninth hour, or 3 p.m. And Jesus has been hanging there for about six hours. Darkness has covered the land for the last three hours. There is certainly something going on here that is different than the thousands of other crucifixions that have been carried out by the Romans. And it is in these words that we are taught the doctrine of the atonement and the substitutionary death of the Son. That Jesus was, was no mere man who, who died just to model for his fellow man how to be selfless and humble. This death was not the same as the two thieves experienced right beside him. One of them is still in, in this present time feeling the wrath of the Father, while the other one is in paradise, never having to suffer this judgment. But it's in these words that we have the climax of Jesus' suffering. The eternal fountain of love for the Son shut off. The unbroken chain of unity severed. The untainted fellowship soiled. No more Father, but my God. Something is happening here that goes beyond a common man dying on the cross. Packer says it like this. What then must it have meant to be forsaken now by God? Oh, the hiding of God's face from him was the most bitter ingredient of that cup that the Father had given the Redeemer to drink. See, this is a statement that we see that the cup has not passed from the Son. That the full wrath of the Father is being poured out on his eternal Son. This is what Isaiah foretold would happen to the Messiah in Isaiah 53, 3-12. That he would be smitten of God. That he would be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. That our chastening fell upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. That all of our iniquity has fallen on him and that the Lord was pleased to crush him as he was our guilt offering, as he bore our iniquities, as he poured himself out to death, and then as he bore the sin of me. See, it's this statement that reveals the cup of the Father's wrath being poured out on the Son. The sinless, righteous Son taking on sin in the Father's wrathful cup, emptying. Um, and this is the agony that Jesus is crying out for, from. This is what causes the anguish of the Son. 
And it's in this statement that we can see God's hatred of sin. It's in this statement that we see God's provision for us. We see that God is both just and the justifier. He both punishes sin and makes atonement for it. This is the purpose of the cross. This is the purpose of the incarnation. This is the purpose of creation. For God to reveal His glory through the salvation of His own by providing for them a sacrifice in righteousness that they could never attain on their own. It is in this statement that we see when all the unredeemed will suffer for all eternity. Brothers and sisters, for you and me, these are some of the sweetest words that a son could ever speak. It's in these words that we have the reality of 2 Corinthians 5.21 happening. This is the time when Jesus, who knew no sin, for our sake was made to be sin. From the beginning of creation, the Son of God had witnessed and participated in the Father's judgment on sin. The Son of God was there when Satan was thrown out of heaven. The Son of God was there when Adam and Eve were dismissed from the garden. He was there at the Tower of Babel. He was there when the waters came flooding up in Noah's day. He was there at Pharaoh in Egypt. He was there with with Israel in the wilderness. He was there at the fall of the northern kingdom. He was there at the fall of the southern kingdom. He was there in the years of silence where no prophetic word was given to His people. Jesus knew firsthand the hatred the Father had towards sin because it was His own hatred towards sin. And He knew the punishment that it deserved. And yet because of His love for the Father and His great love for the elect, He willingly went to the cross. He willingly obeyed the Father's will. He willingly exhausted the Father's wrath. He willingly endured the Father forsaking Him for you and me. full wrath against sin falling on the righteous one. The son being treated as if he had sinned every sin that I have sinned. Bearing the full punishment. The breaking of fellowship. The separation that you and I had earned and deserved. Peter says it like this in 1 Peter 3.8. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. There certainly had to be a shedding of blood. There had to be a sacrifice on our on our behalf. And I don't want to diminish the importance of, of those things. But the anguish and the rejection, the taking on sin that Jesus endured, the the spiritual forsakenness was much more than the physical pain that Jesus went through. And this was done because He loves, yes, the Father, but because of His great love to me and me, brothers and sisters. And if this did not happen, This is what you and I would have to go through for all eternity. So if Jesus being forsaken, you and I would be. This is why these words are so sweet. That our Savior's great love for His own caused Him to endure a punishment that you and I could never imagine and a punishment that you and I will never experience. So it's at the cross where we see God's character put on display most clearly. 
And some of that is revealed in the very words that Jesus spoke while he hung there. For each and every believer. We hear of his compassion for the sinner. We hear of his wonderful grace towards the soft heart of repentance. We've heard of his affection for those who are adopted by the Father, and we hear of his sacrificial love for those he dies for. Brothers and sisters, I pray that these words would be on your minds and hearts this week. That they would draw you to him. They would draw you into a closer relationship with him. He is our gracious and compassionate, affectionate, loving Savior. And that they would cause you to be thankful so that you might praise and worship Him for these glorious truths. Because He is certainly worthy of our worship. Pray with me. Father, uh, words thank you or seem so small in comparison to what we really need to be saying the words are not enough our praise and our worship falls short of your worth and Lord we acknowledge that and yet we still want to worship you Lord impress these words upon our minds impress these truths upon our minds this week Help us to love you. Help us to trust and obey you. Help us to worship you and lie to you. These things in Jesus' name. Amen. Justine, as we go through.